Hello, friend. Like you, I've wondered what it means to live a good life. I don't have many answers, but the moment I picked up a blowtorch and marveled at the simple power to solder one copper pipe to another, I knew that one piece of the puzzle was to make a wonderfully artsy, stupendously oversized dual fuel towel rail. Of course, all this cutting could be done by hand, but having a stop block and a mitre saw with a multi-material blade sure does make it easier. It's tough stuff. It's not all in the bend. The initial vision for this towel rail involved almost no joints and lots of bends. It was going to be a squiggly 28 millimeter wiggle fest. Wonder. No, no inside edge kinks. Ah. Oh. Ha, <laughs> spoke too soon. Yes. Okay, hey, that worked better. Much better. There's a big jump in difficulty in bending 15 millimeter pipe to bending 22 mil pipe to bending 28 mil pipe, which is a lot harder. So much so that 28 millimeter copper pipe benders are really quite expensive. And a huge part of this video before I edited it all out was me making a pipe bender. Oh, Sam was cleaning up the shower tray, but now it's acquired some <laughs> nice new goose poo. Are you proud of that one, are you? In the end, the design changed, and instead of bending, we got to practice a lot of solder joints. I forget that pretense. <laughs> there it is, nothing soldered yet. Bringing on some bits to change 22 to 28 mil in a T format, and I think we can put this together in the meantime. So these are going to be little shelves right up the top. Each of them needs a vent, unfortunately, because they go higher. That's going to go in there like that. Before soldering any bits like this, of course, we do need to take off the, any rubber sealy bits. So first one. Unsurprisingly, through the many, many joints I made in this project, I got quite a lot better at soldering. The first step is to make all the mating surfaces clean, bright and tight. Same motto as electrical connections. Fine emery cloth is good for this and a wire brush for the internal surfaces. The flux gets thinly spread on the male parts only. This way, when you assemble the pipe, most of the corrosive sludge gets pushed to the outside where you can wipe it off, which would be better than the other way around where it would contaminate the inside of the pipe. There's a question about how big and elaborate of an assembly do you make before you solder it up? And this is what I started with. It's gonna be the front side, they're gonna be like this. So I'm gonna flip them over and solder from this side in an attempt to make joints that aren't too visible. As I went on, I stopped turning the torch down to begin with, leaving it on a very aggressive setting to preheat the parts. For general plumbing, I think a low setting's a good idea. Just not when you've got hundreds of joints to make in big assemblies, especially when they're 28 millimeter pipe. Of course, there's a very real danger of overheating the copper, but in the beginning section where you're not actually dabbing on the solder, you can move the torch around all over the place quite freely. Well, after deliberately setting the assembly one way round, it turns out the messiest part isn't where you dab the solder on, but more where it beads up and gravity takes it to the lowest point. You can clean the worst of those beads off by melting them directly with the blowtorch and then flicking them off with a wire brush. With 28mm copper, it's said that it's a good idea to dab the solder on in a few different places just to make sure it runs to the whole circumference of the joint. 
but honestly I didn't find it any trouble to get a nice ring of sold around the whole joint especially when I managed to get the heat directly opposite where I was adding the solder. In general, the solder will flow to the hottest area. That is, of course, unless you way overheat it, which would burn all the flux out, and then the solder won't want to stick to the copper in those areas, and it will just sort of flow out of the joint, leaving what people call a dry joint, which essentially is one that will leak, causing wetness everywhere. After a bit of experience, I started prepping and fluxing much bigger assemblies. They take a bit of thought as to how you sequence them and manage the heat flow throughout the assembly. If you get it right, it's pretty cool because you're preheating the joint you're about to move on to as you're making a joint. Mercifully, most of the joints here are on the flat horizontal plane. But for the vertical ones, as a general rule, you want to start at the bottom and work your way up using the heat of the torch to try and draw the solder upwards. That'll counteract the tendency of gravity to make it run out of the joints. Here it is, the final awkward gritty bit. Let's see how we do soldering this up. Unlike the rest of the tower rail, this little grid section's made of a slightly smaller 22 millimeter copper pipe. Well, that was quite epic. As you see, I was overheating here, there and everywhere. Got it done though. And then with just a few more joints down the bottom, we're getting to the most important part of this whole build. Here we go, I'm about to hook it up. If there's no leaks, I'll just be over the moon. I'll be really happy if there's just one or two. And if I've just systematically cocked up every one of the joints, then I'll be quite pissed off. <laughs> Let's see how it happens. Safety squints engaged. Oh, we're at 0.54 and I don't hear any crazy hissing. Pressure's going up on the big gauge. I can hear it leaking from around here. Okay, we've passed 1.5 bar. That's all I really wanted to get to. Ah, now then, I can hear it leaking from these bits here. I suspect there's some people screaming at the monitor saying how dangerous this is to pressure test with air, but it's relatively low pressure. Air is actually a bit more searching than water, meaning it will find smaller gaps to come out of, so it's a bit more thorough in some ways. More important than any of that though is that once I find the leaks that I'm thinking is basically inevitable with this number of joints, I won't need to drain it all down, spend ages drying all the insides of the copper before I can re-solder. I came to really like this method of using soapy water to find any leaks as you get to kind of clean it all up at the same time. Now I can see there's still a tiny one. See air's coming out there now, so found an extra little leak by here, very pinhole. So we've got that to fix. Apart from that, it's all looking good and ready for a slightly higher pressure test wet. So let's release the pressure. Mm. 
This video is sponsored by you, our beloved viewers. If you want to support us, please check out our Ko-Fi shop where you can find things like a book about chainsaw milling, plans for some of our creations and even some free stuff. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Let's get back to the towel rail. Redoing this joint isn't straightforward. I can't take the joint apart because it's all constrained by the assembly, as it were. My options are to brush on a little flux, heat it up, add a bit more solder and hope for the best. Until that little snagget, I thought the grid thing was actually really cool and used up my scrap 22 millimeter pipe. But if you wanted to disassemble a joint and remake it, if the first or second go round was a bit bodged, then it ain't going to be an easy job. And realistically, I can only imagine it will involve cutting out sections and then trying to use slip fit connectors to remake them. So in that way, I am retrospectively overjoyed that I did not muck too many of those joints up. Once it's full of water, this towel rail is going to be quite heavy. One of the reasons we were using 28 millimeters pipe is because the DIY central heating system, which you can see in our previous video, would benefit from an increase in total circulating water. Okay. Well, there's four of them. That's the first one I glued up. So yeah, the towel rail will act a bit like a volumizer tank and plug straight into the underfloor heating system. In theory, this should help reduce the number of stop-start cycles the heat pump compressor has to do and to help when the heat pump needs to defrost its evaporator. The copper strips here are just decorative and will hide the rather large coach screws that will hold these mounts to the wall. It is just one of my favourite things to see wood that comes out of a skip looking horrendously grubby just be transformed into something that looks quite nice. In this case, the outside is mahogany from a broken old bit of furniture and the insides from an old sink worktop cutout. Most of these joints aren't so terrible as far as solder joints go. They're certainly not pretty, not like that sort of joint. So here's how we tidy them up. Where I was a bit overzealous with adding the solder and there's big dollops of it, they get a bit of filing down and that's quite quick. Luckily there's not too much of that and everything else gets fine emery paper starting with 120 and then working up to the higher finer grits. Adequate. Let's talk about the dual fuel nature of this beast and what stops it just exploding. One way this is fueled is via our little heat pump and it's just put in parallel with one of the loops on the underfloor heating system. But I can sense your perplexed outrage. What happens when it's summer and the heating's off but you want your medium to warm towels? Yes, there will be a facility for this. Let me just hook it up to the underfloor heating so I can sort of see that's going to work and then we'll look at it. We've got the fill valve, we've got the flow meter. Now we need to take it all off again so that we can fit in the thermal element there. It's about as unsecure as you could possibly get, but it might just be crazy enough to work. We're fitting a 600 watt, I think it is, 
thermostatic immersion element into the half inch BSP threads we've put on there ready. Nothing too crazy about that and we'd already routed mains power there underneath the underfloor heating so it was right there and ready. Here's what we've got. The tap connector, it's turned on at the moment, it's connected up to a bit of braided hose, another washing machine hose via a little male to male adapter thing. So we need to connect a hose pipe to that top there. Okay, it's the moment of truth, I'm pretty nervous. We flushed the whole thing through for quite a while, the water coming into the bottom, across and then out of the hose pipe. So far, so good. Okay, so I've shut, I've shut the bleed valve or whatever you want to call it up there. And so now it's sitting around mains pressure, which is about six bar around here, which is a decent pressure test. And thus far it's holding, so I'm well chuffed. It needs to withstand 1.5 for regular use. So I've spent a reasonable amount of time scrutinizing all these individual joints. There's so many of them, but none of them seem to be causing any kerfuffle. So I'm really pleased. Here's a bit I've been quite looking forward to. We're going to put this on there. This cool gauge only goes up to two bar, so it wouldn't have liked the pressure test. The foreman's come to investigate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks good. It's rather big. <laughs> Get some good old towels on that. One super important anti-explosion measure to mention is that when this electric immersion heater is on, the towel rail still needs to be open with either or both of these valves permanently on. The rail has access to the expansion vessel on the underfloor heating circuit here. As you can imagine, that's what stops the pressure rising ridiculously and exploding when it heats up. If you didn't do that, you'd have to do some wackiness of leaving air in the top and having some kind of buffer or something. And I don't think that would work very well with a towel rail of this size anyway. I've just been doing a final polish, sorry I've got a dust mask on. And now we're going to do some lacquering. Of course, we don't want the copper to tarnish or stain any of the wet towels. So it's a kind of necessary step, although I don't really enjoy it. This lacquer likes to cure in the warm and I don't want any kind of condensation or anything like that on the copper while I'm doing it. So the underfloor heating is on, meaning the towel rail is also on at a nice low temperature, about 30 degrees. All in all, it's incredibly sturdy, but I did notice the top shelf had a little bit of wibble to I it. I made a final one of these, just an oak piece. Uh, managed to crash the CNC there by zeroing it to the wrong place. Yes. Good, that's going to do the job beautifully. <laughs> Two other little bits and bobs in the bathroom that kind of thing. It's not exactly finished, but it is in use. We have a shower, we have a toilet, we have a mighty towel rail.